Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and welcome to the second part of my response to Stephen Crowder's climate denialist propaganda. In this episode we're going to explore the issue of why it is that climate denialism is profoundly and grotesquely immoral in every respect. We're going to start by considering what the full implications of climate change are and how they interact with and exacerbate pre-existing risks. As an example of the potential impacts of climate change, this figure presents heatwave conditions throughout the Middle East. In the left-hand panel are presented the historical data, that is, heatwave conditions that have previously been experienced. In the right-hand panel are ensemble average conditions that might be experienced during heatwaves under a high carbon emission scenario. There are some pretty high numbers there, but it's not really easy to relate those numbers to human well-being. When talking about human welfare, it's more meaningful to talk in terms of what's called equivalent wet bulb temperature. This is the equivalent temperature at which humidity is 100%. If a human is exposed to a wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees or higher, they will die in a couple of hours. This is because the human heat regulation system relies on evaporation of sweat. In 100% humidity at 35 degrees, sweat will not evaporate. Humans cannot cool themselves and they will overheat. So this figure shows that in at least 50% of model outcomes, portions of the Middle East will become too hot for humans to survive outdoors during heat waves. Here are the results of a similar analysis performed for India and Pakistan. We can see immediately that the ensemble average is less lethal than it was for the case of the Middle East. Does that mean that everything is hunky-dory? Well, no. It turns out that above a wet bulb temperature of 32 degrees C, sustained manual exertion of any kind becomes extremely problematic. This is obviously because as the body heats up and tries to shed its excess heat, it finds it increasingly difficult to do so in such hot conditions. And this turns out to be a significant problem, because in India, most agriculture is undertaken through manual labour. In fact, at the time this video is being made, in May 2022, India is experiencing a particularly intense heatwave. Not only has this heatwave adversely impacted manual labour and agriculture throughout much of India, it has also directly reduced crop yields. This can be expected to drive food prices up, meanwhile driving the income of manual labourers and agriculturalists down. As we move into the future and these heatwaves become more frequent, more intense and of longer duration, the adverse effects can be expected to become more severe. And this is where the impacts of climate change intersect with larger scale strategic problems. While being home to a sixth of the world's population, India has only 4% of the world's fresh water resources. 70% of its surface water is contaminated. No Indian city is capable of providing uninterrupted access to clean water. The location, duration and intensity of precipitation events within India is projected to change dramatically under the influence of climate change, exposing India to the risk of sustained water scarcity. And just reminding everybody of the geographical reality, if push comes to shove, India is going to be competing with China and Pakistan for resources. In fact, the pushing and shoving has already started, as China is in the process of constructing dams which will restrict India's access to Himalayan meltwaters on which its agriculture is highly dependent. And if the dangers of climate-induced resource scarcity are not clear enough, it should also be borne in mind that the countries in this region are all nuclear powers and are all building their nuclear stockpiles. This is a very stark illustration of how the effects of climate change can blossom indirectly into a global scale humanitarian crisis. But it is only one such possible pathway. There are many others. So there are quite a few risks associated with climate change. How do we go about mathematically assessing those risks? Mathematically, we assess emergency quantitatively using this formula. Emergency equals the probability times the damage times the ratio between reaction time and intervention time. The two most important variables for my purposes are reaction time and intervention time. Reaction time is the time between when we are first alerted to the possibility of a negative consequence and when we act to prevent that consequence. Intervention time is the amount of time actually required to prevent the negative consequence. If reaction time is greater than intervention time, then the situation is out of control. There is no opportunity to avoid the negative consequence. Let's look at a practical example. Imagine driving down a dark tunnel where you can only see a fixed distance, say 10 meters in front of you. 
Suppose you see an obstacle in front of you and you want to stop the car. The faster you're going, the longer it takes you to stop the vehicle, the less opportunity you have to avoid the obstacle. As you increase speed, the more out of control the situation becomes, the less opportunity you have to brake in time to avoid a collision, until eventually you are travelling so fast that a collision is simply inevitable. The situation is completely out of your control. Conversely, the slower you go, the more opportunity you have to keep the situation under control. The intervention time in this situation becomes much larger than your reaction time. Returning to the case of climate, we were first warned about the potential consequences of climate change in 1988, more than 33 years ago. Since that time, we have spectacularly failed to do anything significant to prevent the negative consequences of climate change. And this is despite the fact that we are now substantially better informed on how dramatic and profound those negative consequences may be. And yet our public discourse is replete with loudmouthed, mendacious, knuckle-dragging hucksters who insist that full speed ahead and damn the consequences is the best course of action. They're lying, and by lying, they are putting billions of lives at risk. As overwhelming as the scientific evidence is that the potential negative consequences of climate change are utterly catastrophic, things may be even worse than that. As temperatures rise, there is a substantial risk that we may pass various tipping points, at which positive feedback mechanisms may be initiated. Let's look at one example. Ice sheets, snow cover, sea ice and glaciers all reflect solar energy back into space. In the process, they keep Earth's albedo or reflectivity reasonably high and moderate global mean surface temperature. As you increase global mean surface temperature, the ice sheets melt, the snow cover reduces, glaciers retreat. In this process, albedo is reduced and the amount of solar energy absorbed at Earth's surface is increased. This drives up global mean surface temperature and the cycle repeats itself. We can directly observe this phenomenon in satellite observations of Arctic sea ice cover, as shown here. Generally speaking, this is the point in the conversation where Mr. Crowder and his friends love to throw around the work of Edwin Zwolle. Zwolle and his collaborators based their estimates of Antarctic mass on satellite altimetry observations of Antarctic ice elevation. Zwolle's calculated Antarctic ice sheet mass depends on assumptions that he makes about compaction rate and snow accumulation rate. But Zwolle is wrong. We can prove that he's wrong by directly measuring the gravitational influence of the Antarctic ice sheet using satellite gravimetry. And while Zwolle has no independent replication of his results, we have dozens of papers indicating that the Antarctic ice sheet has lost mass. There is not a single analysis of satellite gravimetric data that agrees with Zwolle. Here is a plot of Antarctic ice sheet mass through time. To maintain that the Antarctic ice sheet is actually increasing in mass is nothing short of a lie. Zwolle insists that his methodology is not flawed, and to this day publishes papers trying to buttress his argument. In order to reconcile satellite gravimetry with his results, Zwolle is forced to appeal to the process of material mantle flow in response to changes in surface loading. This process is called glacial isostatic adjustment, and for those of you who are regular viewers, this should be setting off alarm bells because this is my academic speciality. An increase in surface load will result in a lateral displacement of underlying mantle material. Conversely, a reduction in load will lead to a lateral flow of mantle material back underneath the load. In order to reconcile his results with those of satellite gravimetry, Zwolle requires that there is significant ongoing flow of mantle material from underneath the Antarctic continent to underneath the oceans. A net outflow of mantle material cannot be the result of ongoing response to the deglaciation process. Deglaciation involves a reduction in surface load, and therefore a net flow of mantle material underneath the Antarctic continent and an increase in mass. But Zwolle is suggesting an increase in the mass of the Antarctic ice sheet, and therefore an increase in surface load. Is it possible that this increase in surface load is leading to mantle flow from underneath the Antarctic ice sheet to underneath the oceans? No, such a configuration would be physically impossible. For that to occur would require that the load is displacing a greater mass of mantle material than is contained in the load. It would be like throwing a small child into a diving pool and seeing half of the diving pool's water splash out onto the pavement. 
As Wally is just wrong, he just doesn't want to admit it. So I'm sorry for that deviation. Let's return to the subject of climate tipping points. One of the most concerning classes of climate tipping point are those geophysical systems in which a carbon sink suddenly becomes a carbon source. It's easy to get lost in detail when discussing Earth's carbon cycle, so let's really simplify it. For this purpose, we're going to use an analogy. Imagine that Earth's atmosphere is a bathtub and that water levels within that bathtub correspond to atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. In this analogy, carbon sources correspond to taps that are putting water slash carbon dioxide into the bathtub and sinks correspond to the drain that is emptying water slash carbon dioxide out of the bathtub. Now, if sinks and sources are roughly in balance, then carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere should remain relatively constant. And indeed, that is exactly what we observed for the period before human emissions started becoming significant. And then humans came along and started adding their emissions to the natural emissions. You will often hear devout climate denialists banging on about how humans are only responsible for 3% of total greenhouse gas emissions and that natural emissions account for the other 97%. All of which is fine and dandy, except that the natural emissions are compensated for by natural sinks, and the human emissions aren't. This is again reflected in the observational record, which shows a significant increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide levels since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So in this particular class of tipping point, what happens is that one of the sinks on which the system has relied suddenly turns into a source, and carbon dioxide levels rise even further. It's worth remembering that at this point we only have control over the emissions we're responsible for. If we turn a sink into a source, we have no control over that process. Once it becomes self-sustaining, the horse is bolted. An example of such a system is permafrost. In very cold conditions, during the spring, vegetation grows, and then during winter it dies, and is eventually buried. But it doesn't decompose because there is not enough heat for decomposition to occur. If there is a change in climate and heat is added to the system, all of a sudden, this buried vegetation can decompose and produce methane. Methane itself is a very potent greenhouse gas. So methane emissions result in more warming, which results in more defrosting of permafrost, which results in more decomposition, which results in more methane. We already have observational evidence of this occurring in the form of satellite spectroscopy of methane emissions in the Arctic. We also have other evidence that this is occurring in rather more spectacular fashion, with these large blowholes appearing where methane has exploded out of the Siberian tundra. Forests are another example of a carbon sink that may at some point turn into a carbon source. By default, trees take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into cellulose. But if trees start dying off in significant numbers, they will decompose and release their carbon back into the atmosphere through the process of decomposition. Large-scale tree mortality may be triggered by human encroachment and deforestation or by population collapse amongst pollinating insects, who are themselves vulnerable to the influences of climate change and human activity. Forest health can also be adversely impacted by increased erosion or increased frequency, intensity or duration of flood events. Similarly, more frequent, more intense and longer droughts adversely impact tree health. And of course the same can be said for forest fires, which provide perhaps the most spectacular and striking examples of negative climate consequences. Yet again, we have observational evidence confirming that this is occurring. This is a plot of global vegetation resilience. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but since 2004, there's been a significant deterioration in vegetation resilience. It takes each pixel of vegetation longer and longer to recover to its original state from a negative impact. I've focused on the terrestrial biosphere here, but there are similar concerns about the ocean's biosphere. These are only some of the tipping points that we're aware of, and there may be other tipping points that we won't be aware of until after we've triggered them. Returning to the car analogy, this is like driving at high speed into a dark tunnel that is full of landmines. There is no other way to describe climate denialism other than idiotically myopic. There's no strategy, there's no rationality, there's just full speed ahead and hope that there are no landmines and we don't hit anything. They're putting an incredible amount of faith in dumb luck, emphasis on the dumb. Let's look again at the mathematical formulation for emergency. We are already seeing warning signs in the observational data of the negative consequences of climate change. 
We know that the damage is potentially catastrophic. We know that the intervention time is extremely large. But climate denialists insist that we piss away more of our reaction time. At this stage, the only thing we don't have much uncertainty about is when exactly the catastrophically negative consequences of climate change are going to become unavoidable, if they aren't already. You know, it's a great thing that climate denialists are, for the large part, wealthy people living in developed nations. Because the victims of what's going to happen, the billions of lives that they're putting at risk, aren't. They're generally poor people in developing nations. I mean, if you're going to bet anyone's life on a crackpot theory with no scientific support, it's going to be somebody else's life and not yours, right? And this is why I've reached the conclusion that climate denialism is intellectually and morally bankrupt. It displays nothing short of a murderous indifference to the well-being of others, and I've no time or tolerance for it. Anyway, I might call a halt there before I say something intemperate. Thank you very much for watching. I won't say I hope you enjoyed it, but I do hope it was at least informative. Thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you'll join me next time when I discuss something less infuriating.